Live from the Business Radio X studio inside Renaissance Bank, the bank that specializes in understanding you. It's time for North Fulton Business Radio. And hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of North Fulton Business Radio. I'm John Ray, and folks, we are broadcasting from inside Renaissance Bank on Main Street in beautiful Alpharetta. And folks, if you are looking for the best bank in Georgia, well, that's what Time Magazine's money.com says. That's the results of their survey. Um, then check out Renaissance Bank. That's what they found. And you know what? I tend to agree because of one simple thing. I've used their services and uh, they've done great by me. And uh, so if you would like a better experience for your bank, for your banking needs, Go to renaissancebank.com and find their local office and give them a call. I think you'll be glad you did. Renaissance Bank, understanding you, member FDIC. Now I want to welcome Jay Weiser. Jay is with Jay Weiser Consulting. Jay, welcome. Hey, John. Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure to have you. Let's talk about you and your firm. How are you serving folks out there? So uh, my background has really been around helping organizations and leaders. How do they execute and manage strategy? And especially now during times of disruption, how do they do that in a world that's been disrupted and uncertain? How do they not get caught by surprise? Well, we've just got the calmest world. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, we've been through, let's see, a pandemic. We've got a war in Ukraine now. We've got... Um, uh, an economy that uh, has gone up and down and all around. Um, I can see how that uh, you, that need would be there. Talk about uh, a little bit about your background and kind of w- your journey toward this point. Sure, sure. So my background, I started off actually in banking, and it was interesting because it was back in the mid eighties. Mm. And if you remember, inflation was crazy. That interest rates were super high. Yeah, And one of my first lessons I remember is going to credit committee. And the question was, what would make the loan go bad? And you had to think about different scenarios. So fast forward to where we are now. When I'm working with companies, it's always, what if? What if these different things happen? What are they aware of? And over time with my career, I worked with leadership teams, Fortune, Forbes 500 companies, down to middle market companies, companies in retail like Publix and Tiffany, down to a company that sold children's books to children's libraries. Mm. You know, so a very specific niche, much smaller company. But really in all the cases is how do you help these companies reach their potential? Everybody has a strategy. Everybody, you know, maybe good, maybe bad at executing it. But now you add in disruption and uncertainty, it just adds a whole other level of complexity. Mm. And how do you help leaders think differently, see differently? So that that's what got me to where I am. That's that's a game I've been playing for a while. And you know, it's for me it's really rewarding when you start to see that executive conversation change and they're learning things because it, it's all inside them. It's not me saying, hey, this is how you should run your business. Right. It's asking the right questions. So they they can come up with the answers as a team. Do you think, let's talk about that banking background, because banking has gone through a huge uh, change since that time. You mentioned interest rates, but there's been uh, merger fever uh, throughout all that time. Uh, uh, the uh, recession of 2008, when many banks went out of business, um, does that having that background, do you think, give you a, a particular insight into disruption? I, I think the idea is when it can come from so many different places mm-hmm. and the impacts can be huge. You know, if you think back, I mean, I can go back to the early 90s, but let's just talk 2008, and you think about the mortgage crisis, you think about how loans were underwritten, how certain assumptions were made, and people made bets based on those assumptions saying, oh, this would never happen. Well, it did. Mm. And 
you have to test and challenge those assumptions. Was it, you know, was it wise to do appraisals a certain way? Was it wise to assume a certain occupancy rate? Right. So, I mean, I, I take that knowledge and, and some of the pain and suffering I saw clients go through and say, well, how does that apply in this situation? Mm. You know, so yeah. Tiffany at one point was a client. Well, if all of a sudden interest rates go up, unemployment goes up, Wall Street's under pressure, Tiffany's in New York, those guys don't get big bonuses, they don't go into Tiffany and buy what they used to buy. Right. That changes the economics of the business. So what do they need to do? Mm -hmm. And how do you prepare for that? And, you know, maybe you change your product mix. Disruption is something that is often unexpected. So talk about the, the kind of disruption that you can plan for because you know it may come, a recession, right, for example, or the kind of unexpected disruptions that come out of the blue. Um, the pandemic is a great example. Well, I mean, the, the thing that's interesting, uh, you know, even something like the pandemic, I was reading an article from a business magazine, uh, Strategy in Business 2003, and they talked about actually running a scenario for the government about a pandemic, mm. res- upper respiratory type thing, and and the steps they would go through. In 2003? In 2003. Wow. Now, obviously, they threw those books away and they threw that study away because it kind of felt like we start from scratch. Mm. Um, and people look at some of these disruptions and say, oh, it's once in 100 years. But if you look over the last 20 years, how many one in 100 year disruptions have there been? 9 11, the recession, Hurricane Katrina. Mm-hmm. You start to look at some of you know, the crazy weather we're getting. Uh, you, know, you look at Ukraine. So there is big type disruption. There's also disruption that can happen in your own market. You know, all of a sudden, you know, electric cars, if somebody wasn't looking out, for a company like Tesla, who could completely revolutionize revolutionize the market, mm-hmm. it's are you paying attention to the surroundings? Netflix, Blockbuster, Kodak, Fuji. Um, you, know, you think about online shopping, Instacart, all of a sudden coming on the market. Is are you thinking through different things? Now, I'll be the first one to tell you. People could never have been prepared for the pandemic. Right. Nobody was perfectly prepared, but there were companies who were better prepared because they were used to dealing with disruptions before. You know, everybody had a laptop because, like in New York City, I forget the name of the bank, but in 1994, when the first World Trade, Trade Center bombing happened, that bank made sure everybody had a laptop. So when 9-11 happened and they had to work from home, it wasn't such a big deal because they already had laptops. All right. And fast forward now with a pandemic, well, again, not a big deal because they knew what they had to do if they had to work from home. So I think in a lot of these cases, you can do things to make yourself better prepared. You know, a more open, transparent organization, less layers, empowering people to do more so that if something bad happens, you're ready and you have some things in the background. So, so you're not surprised. I mean, another example, I mean, Publix is a huge supermarket here. Mm -hmm. Hurricanes are something they know are going to happen in the Southeast. They know what's going to happen in Florida. Right. So they have playbooks. They have plans in place. They watch the hurricane as it comes and they adjust. But if you remember, there are always people you see in Florida at the last minute. It's like, oh, there's a hurricane. It's going to hit tomorrow. Well, if you were watching the signals, you would have known that for the last two weeks. Right. And you would have prepared. Right. And it's the same thing with companies. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So is, is it a situation that it's not so much knowing the specific scenario, but understanding how you need to react to scenarios, is that really what you're getting at? Yeah, because the last thing you want to do is, you know, an emotional reaction, a knee-jerk reaction. Mm-hmm. You know, 
if you have some level of preparation, if you thought through different things, doesn't have to be the exact thing, but you say, okay, let's take a step back. Let's make a considered decision. You don't have time to analyze something for months. You have to make a decision. But maybe it's worth 30 minutes of conversation before you jump to it. Mm. And you think about the implications of that decision. It might say, oh, that might make sense right now, but is that going to hurt me down the road? Right. Uh, Folks, we're here chatting with Jay Weiser. Jay is uh, principal and founder of Jay Weiser Consulting. Uh, Jay, you contend that new leadership, new leadership capabilities are needed. Uh, explain. So, if you think about leaders today, we've all had different experiences. You know, we had business school ten years ago, twenty years ago. We maybe had ten years of experience as a CFO. We rely on that experience and expertise. And when things are the same, that experience and expertise is worth a lot. Mm. When things all of a sudden are different, that bag of tricks doesn't work anymore. You know, the saying is, you know, what got you here won't get you there because things have changed. So you have to always be learning. And, you know, this whole idea of new capabilities, leaders have to adapt. Companies have to adapt. You know, that, that's where new approaches come in. And, you know, as I was thinking about that, going back maybe a year, year and a half, I said, what new capabilities do leaders need to have? And that's when I came up with this leadership framework called mm-hmm. the five leadership superpowers. This does not replace things like strategy and motivation and goal setting and being a good communicator. Mm-hmm. But these five superpowers do is help you become prepared for disruption and uncertainty. Disruption can be good or bad. There might be something, somebody gets disrupted, it's an opportunity for you. If you're not prepared and ready, you can't pounce on it fast enough. So let's talk about the five leadership superpowers. So with, with the five leadership superpowers, it's interesting. And, and you know, I'd like to talk about the basis of it first. And a lot of leadership thinking is, I can do this or I can do that. It's all about choices. And it's all about you know this tension or that te- tension. And with the superpowers, it's really about both and thinking. So it's not, you know, do I focus on the present or do I focus on the future? The first superpower actually is be a present futurist, somebody who thinks about both. Mm. Present futurist has a better understanding of what's going on around them from a customer perspective, an employee perspective, a supplier perspective, what's going on in the macro environment. At the same time, they're thinking about where do I want my company to, to go? Who are we going to be five years from now? And oh, by the way, I can't assume things are going to be the same. So what trends do I see? What kind of things do I need to prepare for along the way? So that's the first superpower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that one of those things that where you really need, and I'm, I guess I'm pitching, pitching you and your services here, really. Uh, So forgive me for that folks. But I mean, you, it really helps to have an outside perspective on that, right? And have somebody like you come in to talk about particularly those trends that may be under the radar that companies are not uh, paying attention to. Well, it, it helps to have somebody who can come in who's objective. Yeah. So if, if you're in a company, very often you have blinders on. You mm-hmm. see what you want to see. Right. When I come in, I can ask those tough questions and say, have you thought about what would happen if this happened? How would you respond to, let's say you're in, the delivery business. Well, what happens if fuel prices stay high for the next three years? How does that change your business? How does that change what vehicles you might purchase? So it's somebody who can challenge the thinking, open people's minds up to be much more aware of what's going on around them. And it, it it's not about 
maybe just the particular trends, people may recognize the trends, but part of it, I would suspect, uh, would be just helping figure out probabilities, right? Uh, and you, you would be pretty helpful in that, I would think. Well, and, and the thing is, you know, probabilities are good to a point, but there's so much uncertainty. Mm-hmm. I mean, we heard lots of probabilities during the pandemic. Sure. A lot of them were right. So it's getting used to the fact that you don't know. So how do you operate in an environment where things are uncertain? There are things that you can do to lessen that uncertainty. So, you know, if you know a little bit more, say, about how something's spreading, well, okay, so I can adjust for that. But I still don't know who's going to get it. Right, right. So we talked about present futurist. Um, Accountable collaborator, I think that's the second one I see. Actually, accountable collaborator is number five. But that's, oh, it's okay. That's probably one of the more important ones. Okay. Because accountable collaborator. Things are so complex. You know, everyone talks about cross-functional collaboration. Accountable collaborator, I think the best example is if you think about Navy SEALs, if you think about special forces, mm-hmm. you're bringing together a group of people from a variety of different branches, different specialties, and they're collaborating to accomplish a mission. They're focused on delivering an outcome, and they're accountable for that. Mm -hmm. And they're accountable to each other for what their roles are on the team. Now, if you can do that in a business environment, get away from the silos, get away from the finger pointing and the blame, get people focused on delivering outcomes and results and not worrying about activities. Because, you know, I always say to clients, don't confuse activity with progress. I can be really busy, but not achieving any results. Right. So, you know, I think today it's really about that teamwork. Think about supply chains today. You know, if I'm Publix, I have to be working with my suppliers. I have to be maybe thinking about backup suppliers. I need to, you know, whether it's working with my marketing agency, working with, uh, you know, trucking companies I might contract with. Mm -hmm. So it's not, we're we're on the same team trying to achieve that goal. Right. Got it. Um. I'm not sure, again, if I've got the order right, so correct correct me. It doesn't matter. Uh, okay. Experienced learner. So experienced learner really goes back at something you know, I said earlier. All this experience and expertise only gets you so far. So if, a, if an executive says, oh, yeah, I, I have dealt with something like that 30 years ago. Well, conditions were different. So it's important to balance that experience and learning. And when I talk about learning it's about being curious. It's about asking questions. It's about being open to being challenged and testing assumptions. It's a lot about listening. It's about giving people different experiences, inviting different people into the conversation for that diversity of opinion. Uh, it's not about who's at what level. It's about who knows the information. So if you're in a service business, and we're in Renaissance here, it's the people out front, it's the tellers, it's the customer service reps. They're the ones who are the first ones to hear from the customer. Sure, Leadership should be listening to them. Mm-hmm. And they can, they can be bringing in great suggestions, and we can be learning from them. Yeah, and what you're getting at is that, that our experience can make us overconfident. Yep. Right. I mean, if you over rely on it and you're closed minded, then you're you're not going to be thinking everything through. I mean, you think about Ukraine now and what's going you know going on with Europe. Mm-hmm. Well, we could go back to a you know 1978 mindset. Well, a lot of things were different in 1978, and you know, putting on that mindset we're not going to be aware of so many other things that are interconnected. Yeah. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, word around then. So information communications is something that's critical. Now, how do you spread that news? And that impacts what happens. Folks, we're here chatting with Jay Weiser. He's the 
principal and founder of Jay Weiser Consulting. So, Jay, you talk about one of your five leadership superpowers is being a prepared risk taker. So I think the first thing is risk taking is part of business. I think a lot of times when people are hit with a crisis, they're like, okay, how do I avoid taking risk? How do I avoid loss? Well, there were a lot of companies that kind of hunkered down when things went south with COVID. And because of that, because they didn't think about how can I do business in this environment, what risks make sense, they ended up falling further and further behind where companies who thought about this and said, hmm, if this is happening, I need to make an investment, say, in delivery services. If I'm a restaurant, I, delivery is the way I need to go. Right. And being prepared, you know, we talked about this overall level of preparedness. If we've thought through different things, if we've run different scenarios, and I think if you combine that preparedness and risk taking, mm-hmm. you're more prepared, you can take more risk you can mitigate some of that risk you're taking. And it's also about making fast, informed, better decisions. So it's bad if all you do is prepare, 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 and never do anything. Mm -hmm. So equally as bad if you're like, well, let's try this, let's try that, without thinking about the risk. So again, it goes back to that both-end thinking. Got it. And finally, strategic executor. So strategic executor. Okay. So <laughs> works, e- works either way. Either maybe, way. Maybe yeah. that's a British pronunciation. Uh, I don't know. I've, I've got, I don't think my accent fits there, but no. anyway, let's try it. Let's, <laughs> let's go ahead. Anyway. Uh, but, but the whole thing in there is how do you balance strategy and execution? A lot of people say, you know, the people up top do strategy and the people out in the front do execution. Well, everybody needs to be doing both. Strategy isn't something you do once a year. Strategy is something you need to be talking about and adapting throughout the year, especially if conditions are changing. Mm. Strategy is great, but you only make money and create value when you execute. So how do those two things fit together? It's also strategy people think is long-term execution is short-term. Again, they have to integrate. Delta Airlines, I think, is a great example. When COVID hit, all the airlines lost 90, 95% of their revenue like that overnight. Mm-hmm. All right. Some companies started cutting to the bone, laying everybody off, only worrying about, you know, cash, cash, cash. Delta communicated with their people. They furloughed people. They asked people to take voluntary leave. Uh, and Bastion, their CEO, was very transparent. He was open. He's like, this is new. Well, we're going to figure this out together. So he engaged the team. Their engagement actually went up dur- during the pandemic. And he focused, he said, what's most important, our customers, our employees, and our business in that order. Because if you don't take care of those folks, things aren't going to work. And because he maintained that employee relationship, as things started to improve, they were ready to start growing again. Whereas other airlines who cut to the bone, who got rid of all their aircraft, you run on all these delays. You know, you look at American, you look at United. Right. They've been hurt a lot more. And now they're having to fight their way back. And Delta was already positioned because they balanced that strategy and execution. They knew that their short-term decisions had to make sense for the long-term as well. And this is in an industry that historically does not have very good relationships with their employees, right? And and in a lot of cases, their customers. Yep, yep. I mean, in both cases. And, and you know, the thing is, I mean, I fly Delta a lot. I fly Southwest a lot. And there's mm-hmm. a reason for both of them, because they care about their people. They put safety first. They were flexible in their policies. Mm. And, you know, that makes all the difference. Now, you know, one of the things I want to mention about the five superpowers, Mm -hmm. each one of them supports the other. So they work together as a group. Being a present futurist informs what you need to learn, informs what kind of risks you might be facing. 
And I like to think that a leadership team as a whole you know, should be striving to master and build these capabilities. Now, an individual leader probably will only excel maybe in one or two, and they need to appreciate the other so they can be part of that discussion. Mm, gotcha. So let's talk about, I guess, assessing our superpower capacity, our capabilities there. Yeah, so I think it's important. Um, you got to understand where the client is. So if a client contacts me or a client is talking about, you know, we've been disrupted. Um, you know, now we're coming out of COVID and we're like, okay, how do we plan for the future? And I like to say preparing is the new planning. So it's important to understand where are you coming from? So assessing them on the superpowers, they, they might not call it the superpowers, but I'm going to have a conversation and ask them about, well, how do you balance the present and the future? What do you do to make sure you understand the present? Are you following these practices? Same thing about the future. Mm-hmm. And I've actually uh, put together an organizational survey that looks at each of the superpowers, looks at the circumstances the companies are in, so we can come back and say, you know, you're great with this, you're not great with that. You're following some practices, not others. And work with the team to educate them on the superpowers. I think that's the first thing is you understand what they are, understand how, how they help and why they're important. Then look at how well are you doing those. And lastly, what are the gaps? What do you need to learn? Where can I, you know, where can I help you better develop the superpowers? What do you need to be thinking about? Mm. And the real value comes is when they're applied. So it's not, you know, I can say the superpowers are cool. The seven habits, Stephen Covey are cool. But until they're put in practice, it doesn't matter. So the superpowers come into play. You know, if you're assessing risk and doing enterprise risk management, Mm -hmm. they come into play when you're saying you're planning how you're going to grow. You need to integrate the superpowers into that discussion. Uh, If you're meeting with your board, superpowers should be part of the discussion. If you're a good board member, you're going to be asking questions about how are they addressing each of these tensions, experience and learning and preparedness and risk and so on. Right. Folks, we're here chatting with Jay Weiser, Jay Weiser Consulting. Uh, Jay, this has been great. Uh, What a great roadmap to think about um, uh, and report card, I guess is another way to put it too, to think about how we uh, are working within our companies to uh, uh, deal with disruption before we let you go, though, I'd love it if you could maybe share a success story, someone you've worked with, you don't have to mention names, of course, but that has um, really benefited from the great work you do, that you do. So, yeah, I did work with an automotive internet company, and this goes, goes back a couple of years, and they were in a market-leading position. Uh, the change that was going on in the horizon is mobile technology. Mm. You know, more things on the phone, more things on the iPad. They did most of their stuff on the desktop. Their customers, who were, their consumers who were buying cars were looking at a big screen. And they could use that real estate. Well, all of their competitors were starting to show up on the phone. If I'm at my kid's baseball game, I could shop for a car on my phone in between innings. Mm. I'm not going to bring my desktop to the baseball game. Mm-hmm. And... The thing is that company was so focused on the model of the desktop and how they sold the real estate on the desktop. They were afraid to start to take a risk about where the market was going. Mm. They were focused on what their business model was, not where the customer was going. And in that case, I mean, I was consulting and helping them and I guess maybe that's not so much a success story, but what's the risk if you don't do that? Right. And right. the companies that were more forward thinking ended up excelling and doing a lot better. Sure. You know, so, so I mean, there's, there can be a cost if you don't 
and a benefit if you do. Mm-hmm. I, I'll give you another quick, quick example. Uh, Publix was a client of mine years back. Mm-hmm. Well, all of a sudden, when the pandemic hit, Publix, all of a sudden, a lot of their people didn't show up. A lot of the retirees are saying, hmm, you know, I don't want to go into the store. I don't want right. to get sick. I'm a high school kid. I don't, my parents don't want me coming in. Right. So you had staffing shortages. Well, they had a way of their process took a few weeks for someone to get staffed. And all of a sudden they're like, okay, we don't have three weeks to get staffed. Right. We need to get people on board faster. Mm-hmm. So you think about being a prepared risk taker. What can we do differently so we can hire people faster? And as a result, they've learned things that has streamlined that process going forward. So they've learned things that are going to make them more efficient because of what they learned through the pandemic. Sure. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Wow, great stuff here, folks, from Jay Weiser, Jay Weiser Consulting. Jay, this has been great. Uh, how informative and insightful, and I, I can understand why folks uh, – hire you to do what you do. So, uh, let's, uh, let's get to the most important question though, which for those that would like to be in touch with you and learn more about your work and your services, how can they do that? So I think a couple of ways. First, if you go to, uh, my website, which is jwiser.com. So J A Y W E I S C R.com, uh, can email me at J at J com. Uh, If you look on LinkedIn for J middle initial R wiser, uh, you'll also see I've shared a lot of content about the superpowers, about disruption, about strategy, risk management. Uh, So, you know, there are resources there to learn. And if you go to the website uh, in the upper right hand corner, you can schedule a complimentary discovery call. So a 30 minute call with me to talk about what's going on in your business. Mm hmm what challenges are you facing? We can talk about the superpowers and explore. Does it make sense for us to work together and how I can help? Jay Weiser folks with Jay Weiser consulting. Jay, thanks so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, Hey folks, just a, uh, a quick thought for you. If you are looking for a unique team building exercise event well, let's say one that doesn't involve uh, broken elbows, twisted ankles. Uh, here's an idea. Call my friend over at ANS Culinary Concepts, good old Andrew Traub. Andrew's a great guy, and what he does is he has his culinary studio there, but they actually do team building events. And who thought you could be standing around a stainless steel table, seasoning meat, and cutting up vegetables, and that'd be a great team-building event, but it is. And uh, Andrew's got the recipe for that, if you pardon the pun. So give him a call, 678-336-9196, or go to asculinaryconcepts.com. While you're there, check out their Big Green Egg Boot Camps. They're amazing as well. And folks, uh, North Fulton Business Radio is the search term for this show. If you're looking for it on your ma- on your uh, podcast app, I hope you're looking for it. If you're not subscribed to the show, because uh, it's folks that subscribe and listen to the show regularly and share the show uh, that really help our guests be found, and that's what we're all about: is celebrating the great work of our guests uh, that and well, what they do and how they. Uh, help folks out there. So Jay and his, uh, 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 different, the different guests that we've had on the show over the years, uh, we're all about celebrating their work. So if you could help us in that regard by sharing the show, we would appreciate it. So for my guest, Jay Weiser, I'm John Ray. Join us next time here on North Fulton business radio.